Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul, Paul Klopman. Dr. Klopman is president and CEO of Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he came to uh, Baylor College of Medicine in 2010, and so he's uh, actually celebrating his 10th anniversary with BCM with Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, he got his bachelor's of science from Michigan. He's got his MD from uh, Indiana. So uh, Dr. Kleinman, we're glad to have you with us today. In addition, I wanna uh, introduce Mr. Larry Hurd. Larry Hurd is CEO, CEO of Transwestern, a global real estate uh, um, organization. Uh, he has been CEO since 2002. Larry is a Baylor graduate getting his BBA uh, from Baylor, and he also serves on the Baylor Board of Regents, as well as is a trustee for Baylor College of Medicine. So Larry, we're glad to have you with us today. And then finally, I wanna introduce Mr. Chris Wallace. Uh, Chris Wallace is CEO and CIO of Vaughn Nelson. He's been with Vaughn Nelson since 1999. He's also a Baylor graduate getting his BBA at Baylor, uh, as well as getting an MBA at uh, Harvard. Uh, Chris also serves as a trustee at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So today you're getting a sense of uh, not only the historic connection between Baylor University and Baylor College of Medicine, but also getting uh, firsthand uh, seeing how that relationship continues today uh, at, the, uh, at the board level. So again, I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, joining us uh, for this discussion today. And I especially want to thank Dr. Klopman, Larry, and Chris uh, for uh, their participation uh, on the panel. Uh, as, a, as a reminder, if you uh, want to ask questions, you can use the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to those as, uh, as our session continues. So let me first start with you, Dr. Klopman. And... Uh, to kind of baseline us as it relates to COVID, just summarize how Baylor College of Medicine has and continues to contribute to uh, the COVID care, not only locally here in Houston, but beyond. Uh, well, thank you, Bill. It's great to be here. Hope everyone can hear okay. Um, so one of the things that uh, I think every academic medical center uh, had to deal with this in this particular global pandemic is uh, some of our early public health fumbles, I would say. Um, we were slow out of the box with the CDC in terms of developing tests, actually a wrong test and inaccurate test, and then restriction on, on how to uh, get tests available. And so many uh, academic institutions, including ours, stepped up uh, early on in the pandemic to at least provide testing. And so we were the first in our community to uh, really expand our testing capacity. Um, it's basically the test that was, uh, the PCR test is taking nucleic acid and, and amplifying it. That's an essential step that we do in our genome center every single day. Uh, and so it's very easy to uh, ramp up our genome center into testing as well as um, our lab that traditionally does that, Tony Piedra's lab. Uh, we've been in the vaccine, we've had a vaccine treatment unit for flu for 30 years. And so we were ideally prepared and we immediately started doing testing for our institution, our 15,000 employees, but also our aff affiliated hospitals and particularly their uh, medical personnel. So, you know, early on we did that. We've expanded now to support the city uh, and the county. Uh, we provide almost all the testing for both of those institutions or those uh, government agencies. And so we've been, we've played a very important role in just managing testing. But beyond that, uh, when, when the uh, vaccine trials began uh, and all the trials began, we were, we were one of the major participants. We, we were one of the first to join the uh, uh, convalescent plasma trial uh, consortium that was with Mayo and Hopkins. Uh, we participated in the Gilead remdesivir trial. We were, uh, we were the first in the Moderna trial to actually complete our, our uh, enrollment. Plus we had such a good uh, uh, number of underrepresented uh, uh, folks in, 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 the, in the trial that they asked us to expand our enrollment. Uh, and one of our uh, investigators was, was the co-PI of the Moderna trial. We are starting the Novavax trial. We've been involved with 
five or six other vaccine trials, all participating in order to get what has been uh, the, the really with the most rapid development of vaccines ever uh, in the country or in the world for that matter. Uh, and then finally, we of course have uh, our own Peter Hotez and we, you know, I recruited him in 2011, uh, knowing that, that with global warming in our particular location uh, in the world uh, and all the international travel that we would have problems with uh, viral infections and pandemics. And so we started the School for Tropical Medicine uh, with that intention and, and recruited Peter to be the, the first Dean of that school. Uh, I feel a little bit bad because shortly after hiring him, we had an outbreak of Chagas disease and West Nile and H1N1, Zika. I feel it's like somehow we contributed to that by just hiring him to come. But he was also an expert in vaccine development. And so he developed the SARS-1 vaccine and when the, right around SARS and MERS a few years ago. And so when SARS-2 came along, it was fairly easy for him to pull out of the freezer his construct, uh, change it around a little bit to, to, for the spike protein of this virus. And that has now been licensed to BioE in India. And that's, that construct of his is a very traditional uh, sort of protein-based, it's a spike protein uh, with an adjuvant. Uh, it's very inexpensive and very stable. Uh, and if effective, and I, I, I anticipate it will be effective, uh, there will be a billion doses that made in India. And it's likely that that vaccine will be the one that gets distributed widely to particularly to under-resourced communities because the, the RNA-based vaccines are very difficult to produce and very difficult to uh, distribute because uh, of their, their ultra-cold requirements. Um, there are several other vaccines coming along, obviously. Uh, the adenovirus ones in J&J &J and um, uh, uh, AstraZeneca, but the Novavax one, which is a very interesting one, we are one of the lead investigators for Novavax. So uh, we've been very much involved with policy decisions, educating our community, the mayor, the county judge, many of our house representatives are, in, are national senators and uh, congressmen. And so uh, Baylor has been a prominent, uh, played a prominent role, I think in this pandemic. Okay, well, thank you. Larry, um, as we look at, uh, you know, the global real estate markets, kind of describe the overall impact, uh, you know, the initial impact, I think everybody probably recognized, but the recovery and, and the outlooks, uh, particularly as we're looking at uh, uh, COVID in the future. Sure, thanks, Bill. Uh, you know, commercial real estate's been impaired. Uh, like every uh, industry, but I think the impairment that we've experienced has probably been less than most. I know we have a national audience today, so I would say uh, city by city, it's a little bit of a different answer, and product by product, it's a little bit of a different answer. It's hard to paint that canvas with a single brush stroke, so uh, if, if you're dialing in from New York or San Francisco, you're, you're uh, in a more uh, where transit, mass transit is more in demand, it's tougher to get around in those cities than cities primarily in the South, like Atlanta or Dallas or Houston or, or Phoenix, where uh, transit typically occurs with <clears throat> one person in one car. Uh, but uh, the, the industry has been impaired, transaction activities way off as people uh, stayed home during the spring and summer. Think about it, you're not out trying to lease space in big office buildings. And so that sort of uh, came to a screeching halt unless you had a pipeline of activity and almost everything in the pipeline ended up getting done, which was good. Uh, but we're just now starting to regenerate a lot of that activity and it takes time for those uh, deals to materialize. So across the country, leasing is down about 35% year over year in just one year. Uh, we anticipate 2021 that'll catch back up some, uh, but it's been, it's been a pretty significant uh, impact. And then COVID has introduced concerns we never had before. Uh, think about ride sharing where people would uh, park 20 miles out of town uh, and save the gas and save the toll fee getting on an HOV lane, but you know, you're in a van with 10 people shoulder to shoulder. That was a great situation uh, before the pandemic, not so much anymore. Uh, same thing with uh, elevator capacity. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I was the last one to jump on an elevator, squeeze in 
to save the 60 second wait for the next elevator. Not so much anymore. You know, <laughs> plenty willing to wait. Let's go ahead and, you know, four people on an elevator, get in each corner. Uh, and then um, similarly, dense office configurations, which were, uh, you know, really the rage is packing people in cubicles. And, uh, and there was also a sort of a, a, a byproduct of that is in theory, you have more collaboration. Well, that, uh, that's giving uh, way to uh, uh, more office space, private offices for people, smaller private offices, but nonetheless, where people can go and feel safe and secure. So, but, but I would say on the other hand, the industry is doing pretty well because institutional investors like commercial real estate. They like it as an investment class, as an asset class. Chris can talk about that as he's talking about asset classes, but <clears throat> commercial real estate provides a really good current income. And it's also a hedge against future inflation if we ever have inflation again, because you've got a physical asset. And so what we're seeing is investor allocations to commercial real estate are increasing across um, uh, the investor platforms that when I got into the business in 1980, most of the big insurance companies and pension funds invested about 3% of their assets in real estate. Today, that number is closer to 10%. Uh, in Europe, it's 15% or so, Canada, uh, close to 15%. So I think we're going to continue to see uh, increased allocations to the product type. And usually where there's capital, it will, it will help overcome uh, near-term problems like the one we're having today. Uh, so I think it's a high-level uh, bill, uh, certainly an impairment, but uh, the longer-term future, uh, I feel better about. Great. Thanks, Larry. And Chris, I'll give you a chance uh, as we look at a kind of a macro level before we kind of get into more specifics, but kind of provide from your perspective an overall set assessment of our global and U.S. financial markets. Yeah, That's sure. an easy one, right? Yeah, no problem. Uh, you know, it, it, it can be difficult to reconcile, you know, markets hitting all-time highs when there's still 20 million people unemployed and, uh, you know, real hindrance to economic activity. But it makes more sense when you start putting the pieces together. And if you look at what's unique about this recession is we knew the cause. Uh, we had a pretty good idea or the market participants did of what the duration would be and what the resolution would be. Um, and so it was fairly easy to discount, but at the same time, we had help from a lot of capital and a lot of liquidity. So we had $6 trillion of, of stimulus for really a $2 trillion problem. So that extra $4 trillion has found its way into asset prices, but it also has flowed into goods and services, more so the goods sector than would typically be the case. And so what the markets are really doing is they're front running an economic recovery, and they're not just doing it here in the US. We're seeing very similar patterns across Asia, which is really uh, it probably a quarter or two ahead of the U.S. as far as recovery, and even in Europe where there's even greater challenges. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, split the economy into two pieces. You have an industrial economy and you have a services-based economy. And the industrial economy really was a direct beneficiary of the stimulus. And we sent the stimulus out before we had the economic damage. And so while those funds were directed to goods that were consumed and we drew down inventories, that causes a nat natural flywheel effect of inventory replenishment, which drives hiring, which drives uh, further consumption. And that organic recovery is well underway, not only in the United States, but globally. And so we have a multi-quarter recovery for the industrial side of the economy uh, in front of us over the next really probably two or three more quarters. On the services side of the economy, it's very different, obviously. There's no natural flywheel effect to get someone into a restaurant or back on a vacation. Um, and in a typical recession, you only have about a 1% real decline in, in service jobs. And this time it was closer to 20%. So we have some heavy lifting in front of us. Uh, the market, I think, is discounting not only the recovery on the industrial side, the success of the vaccines that have been announced and are being ro rolled out, but they're also banking on further government stimulus. And what's kind of new this cycle is as we transition from a pandemic-induced depression to a general run-of-the-mill recession, 
is our federal government, which has always been the lender of last resort in the form of the Fed Reserve providing liquidity to capital markets, it's actually now the spender of last resort, that a large percentage of the population is relying on government transfers to sustain themselves. And the damage to the small and mid-sized businesses, which are the engine of job growth, is severe. And it's just going to take a lot of time. And it's probably going to take a lot more than what's available in the private sector to restart that activity. Um, and so I, th I think the markets are set up saying, we know more federal stimulus is coming, and it's probably going to be a little bit more targeted. But we do have a healthy recovery on the industrial side, not just in the US, but globally. Great. Dr. Klopman, go back to you in terms of now, we've kind of seen the macro. And let's go out and look perhaps at what 2021 might look at is, and how the approach for mitigating COVID may evolve as the potential for vaccines emerge and, and, uh, and how that will uh, impact uh, uh, mitigation efforts. So uh, the, the good news and we have uh... Colleen Sweeney on online here who to, can tell us, give us an update on um, where we stand with the approval process. But before we do that, I'll just sort of briefly uh, point out that it, the UK just uh, basically agreed to, to uh, approve the, the Pfizer vaccine. That, that, that probably means in all likelihood the FDA will approve it next week. And the week after that, there'll be the Moderna vaccine. Each one has said they will have 20 million doses. Uh, so that's like 40 million between Pfizer and Moderna, although there are two shots, so it's 20 million people. Uh, if you think about where we need to get as a, as a country uh, where we can go back to what my sister considers normal, which is everybody walking around without a mask on, uh, that would be herd immunity, 65 to 70% of the population either having had the disease or been vaccinated against the disease. And we're 320 million people. So uh, that's several hundred million that have to be vaccinated, 200 and, you know, plus million that have to be vaccinated uh, successfully. So I think if you start thinking about that, the, the ramp up will be significant. I think uh, there'll be the healthcare workers will definitely get vaccinated and hopefully nursing home uh, occupants. And then it'll start rolling out in phase 1A and 1B. Uh, to start including people at high risk and elder, elderly folks. And hopefully by the first quarter of next year, uh, a significant part of the population, particularly the healthcare providers, will be vaccinated. I think it's till June before it's generally available for the rest of the population. Uh, and so we have another six to eight months ahead of us of using standard public health measures that are have worked. I mean, I always remind people, Spanish flu went away in 1918 without a single vaccine by simply people adopting mask wearing. So uh, physical distancing and mask wearing is in our future, at least for another half a year. Uh, and, and so I, I do think, uh, you know, people even ask me if I get vaccinated, will I, have, will I have to wear a mask? Well, until there's herd immunity, you know, there's still, even if it's 90% or 80% effective, that still means one in 10 or two in 10 chances that you will get the disease and it's not a good disease to get. So I think we will still have this sort of uh, impairment uh, in our social behavior for a, another half a year. Uh, but, you know, I'd be really interested in, in hearing uh, Captain Sweeney's view. She is a, a reg, one of the director of the regulatory review office for vaccines and has been very intimately involved with uh, the timeline for vaccines. So maybe uh, just two things I'd like you to, maybe you can tell everybody about is, you know, just explain to them what the route of approval is and normally and in emergency use. And then maybe just you could opine on the, your view of the timeline for when these will be available. Uh, that'd be great. Hi, can you hear me? You can. Okay, thank you. you so see. I'm Colleen. Okay, let me see if I can see. Good a second. Okay, ago. can you see me? Okay. 
Okay, so thank you for having me. And I'd just like to actually thank you all for your involvement in expediting this vaccine development program. So as, as you had mentioned, Dr. Klotman, right now what we are doing is we will, on December 10th and December 17th, respectively, be meeting for authorizing emergency use of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which is a little bit different from our traditional approach of licensure. So we will meet then, and the probability of moving forward with authorizing these for emergency use is probably about 99% if they actually go to a VRPAC meeting. So we will plan on expediting that and moving forward. Um, the difference between, as you had mentioned, um, licensure of a vaccine and authorization for emergency use is basically the time frame. Um, as you know, it takes in the minimum about five years to develop a vaccine. So with the emergency use, what the biggest difference would be actually, as you had mentioned, would be um, the conditions of the vaccine transportation and the conditions of the storage, which we are, and I'm sure everyone else are concerned about. <clears throat> and but we will move forward and we will all uh, come together and figure that out. So yesterday, um, as I had mentioned, we voted on the APAC vote, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, as you know, voted on moving forward with the population allocation for phase 1A. Um, and what, after eight months of discussions and meetings, we went ahead and, um, stated that when the COVID vaccine was authorized by us, the FDA, the ACIP and the healthcare personnel and residents of the long-term care facilities would be offered the vaccination or the initial uh, COVID vaccine program, the phase 1A program. So we're gonna move forward with that. And then after the phase 1A, the phase 1B and C are a little bit controversial, but it, is said to be stated that it would be for the essential workers. And then we will move forward with adult populations over 65 and any compromised individuals. <clears throat> That's great, Thanks. thank you for that. Um, I think one of the little nuances uh, of, of all of this is that while the federal government make, makes uh, recommendations, usually uh, the actual distribution goes by the state. Mm -hmm. The states Correct. have their own little <laughs> nuanced <laughs> versions of it. So that this there's federal recommend recommendations mm -hmm. and the states sort of do their thing. And hopefully uh, they do follow the guidelines, but uh, uh, we, we will, I will certainly be looking for you all <laughs> to give us advice, but you know, once it, basically it gets to the state level and then they distribute it. So I am on calls with our state leadership trying oh, to okay. follow the guidelines. Anyway, thank you for participating. I love all your your uh, bars on there. That's what happened to <laughs> the public health service for a long time. <laughs> it's just as true. <laughs> now, I, I, I believe, Colleen, you're, are you also a Baylor Bear? My daughter is a Baylor Bear, and I came upon your meeting um, as I was browsing through looking at the Christmas ornaments, and I said, oh, isn't this very interesting? So I, uh, I thankfully, Dr. Kaltman, um, let me hop onto this meeting. But yeah. as, as so I will just, let me just mention that, you know, as you had mentioned now, it's at the state level. So what the states now are doing is my understanding of the inter-framework. Uh, yesterday. Is so going to give the federal government a number of the uh, allocations that would be needed for certain states and certain jurisdictions. And so it will be validated based on that allocation of population. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. You know, Larry, as we look at uh, 2021, we still have a lot of companies that uh, are not in office, in their office space. Uh, we've seen some sectors of the real estate market more resilient than others. Uh, you know, what do you think that that's going to look like over the next year? And what are you hearing from your clients in terms of uh, occupancy and, and just the interactions in the office? Yeah, Bill, I think that that's sort of the, that's the FAQ for commercial real estate. If, if people ask Dr. Klopman, hey, when is the vaccine going to be here? He gets that, that every day. And people ask Chris, hey, should I put more money in the stock market? 
the, the question we get in the commercial real estate is where are the winners and losers by product type. And, and I would say that um, I put them in kind of three buckets. So the, the product that are performing the best is the industrial and logistics space, the multifamily space, and interestingly, life sciences. And I would say at the top of that heap is probably industrial and logistics, part of that whole e-commerce effect, which is really accelerated as people stayed home through the summer and fall. And now are you know, we're going to begin to stay home more again with the surge that's taking place across the country. And the online uh, purchasing of the consumer, which the consumer has remained fairly resilient through this whole process, but uh, changing their patterns. And so what, what that has done is that shifted a lot of the retail store shop retail to online in the distribution of products the Amazon effect, uh, Walmarts, uh, those companies are leasing space all over the country like crazy mm -hmm. and signing long-term leases with lots of credit, uh, which institutional investors like. And so industrial uh, space and logistics has done very well. Uh, the multifamily sector has performed fairly well as well. Uh, you know, we still have a shortage of single family housing across the country. And you'll, you're seeing a bit of a boom in the construction of single family housing, which has never happened in a downturn before. It's very unusual to have single family housing beginning to explode when we're in the midst of a global pandemic uh, and, and effectively recessionary uh, features because of the slowdown in the economy. But the multifamily sector has been doing very well. I would say most of the markets around the country have been overbuilt slightly in the urban cores. And what we're seeing now is most of the new multifamily product is going to the suburbs. <clears throat> we call that workforce housing, where, where the majority of the workforce lives. And, and so the price point is lower. <clears throat> the rent, monthly rent is lower uh, than it would be in, say, a high rise if you're in Houston on Kirby and West Timer. And so uh, <clears throat> that uh, space has done well. And then also life sciences, which is a very small space relative to office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. The, 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 the life sciences is getting a lot of action, a lot of attention to this global pandemic. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that take place in Houston too. Um, you can see all that the Baylor College of Medicine is doing and all the research and advancements and breakthroughs. And, you know, years ago, a lot of that, and you know, frankly, currently still goes off to Cambridge or goes off to the West Coast um, to be commercialized. And I think a lot of the efforts around uh, Baylor College of Medicine, the Texas Medical Center, TMC3, is, is trying to keep a lot of that innovation here in, in, in Houston. And those products have done the best. I would say in the middle tier is probably office space and, and healthcare facilities. You know, office buildings, if you have a lot of term and credit, in other words, you get a state farm or an Exxon or somebody on a 10 or 20 year lease, uh, people aren't worried about the pandemic 10 years from now. They're not worried about it, frankly, in, in the short term. But if you have a lot of term and a lot of credit, there's plenty of capital to buy those kind of office buildings. If it's a multi-tenant building in the suburbs or in other places, th th there's no price discovery on rents yet. So when we come out of this, how, or how, how impaired are rents going to be? Are they going to be down 5%, 10%, 15%? So it's really hard to underwrite an acquisition today. And then I would say at the, uh, uh, the bottom tier from an investment perspective on a short-term basis is retail and uh, hospitality, which is of course hotels, and then primarily hotels that are dependent on business travel. Uh, we, we, we believe business travel is going to be off for some time. It will slowly recover, and there'll be more travel next year than there was this year, and next in the following year, even more. But before it gets back to pre-COVID levels, my guess is that could be three or four years before it fully returns uh, to those levels. And people like uh, Southwest Airlines predict maybe even longer, and they know more about it than I do. Uh, and then I would say the retail, <clears throat> retail space has also been uh, very significantly impaired uh, and it'll be a while before the retail space returns. So it's a bit of a mixed bag, but again, lots of capital uh, looking for the, for the right product. And we're, we're actually seeing capitalization rates on things that are trading or going down, or, or it's becoming even more expensive to buy well-located industrial products, well-located multifamily. And then there's just not much transaction activity in the, uh, 
in the in the product types that have been more impaired. Yeah, well, in retail, not only COVID, it's go, it was going through its own uh, transformation from a market standpoint before COVID. This is just kind of accelerating. And, and to that point, Bill, uh, one thing we say is where were where were each of the products pre-COVID? And those that were doing well pre-COVID, we believe will come out faster. Faster. And to your point, those that were really struggling pre-COVID are going to, they'll be, they'll be a, long, a longer recovery. Yeah. Good. So Chris, as we look at uh, 2021, not only are we talking about COVID, but we've had this thing called an election occur in the U.S. And, uh, and uh, assuming uh, a new administration coming and I'll, uh, Tell us, you know, what do you what do you think's in store for the the markets uh, over the next uh, year or so? Yeah, um, you know, I think we, as Larry was mentioning, we've had a, a bit of an unusual situation where you've had accelerations in demand in areas you wouldn't expect it, whether it's in home improvement or single family construction, and yet we've delayed the business travel. So this push pull economy is going to continue. And the market's starting to discount a reversal. So areas that were beneficiaries of demand being pulled forward into 2020 um, is now starting to be uh, sources of funds as people begin to redeploy money into the areas of recovery, even for the publicly traded hotels that, that are exposed to business travel. You know, those areas of the market are starting to outperform and, and do better. Uh, but the market's still discounting almost a full earnings recovery back to 2019 levels in 2021. And that's probably a little optimistic. Um, and at the same time, it's gonna be very reliant on um, the discussion around fiscal stimulus and, and how that shakes out. Cause as I mentioned, it's gonna take uh, more checks from the federal government to restart the services side of our economy. Uh, if you factor in government transfers during 2020, during 2020, we saw the largest increase in personal income. Personal income was actually up 11%, even though wages were down high single digits and we all know what happened to employment. Well, those stimulus checks clearly roll off. They've gotta be replaced in order to have this sustained recovery in 2021. The irony is, is, is just when you, you don't think politics could get more divisive, I think they become less relevant. And the reason they become less relevant is neither party has a choice with what they can really do. I mean, if they want to face midterms with a healthy economy, they're going to have to spend money fiscally. Uh, we can change rhetoric. We can change villains. Uh, but at the end of the day, the policy choices are, are fairly narrow. Uh, and you can see that with who we've selected for the Treasury Secretary, a, a former Fed chairman. Um, you can already see the discussions and you can see the research papers being written about we'll need to provide jobs to the, to the middle class and we're going to do it with monetary policy. Well, the reality is the only way to do that through money printing is through more fiscal transfers. And you're also starting to see discussion, not just out of our central bank, but the PBOC, the uh, Chinese central bank, as well as the BOJ in Japan and the ECB of the need to develop their own digital currency. And that's not to compete with Bitcoin, but it, it truly is to deal with these structural issues we face longer term and be able to open accounts for people and bypass the traditional banking system to get spending power into the hands of the general population. So I think 2021 um, is gonna set up to be an interesting time period because I, I, as I said, we pull forward a lot of demand, we've deferred a lot, I think there's going to be areas in the market. Uh, as an example, you know, if if you're a physician, um, you probably weren't as busy in the first half of the year as you were the last half this year. And patients that are coming back for treatment are coming back with higher levels of acuity. Um, and so, areas of the economy that are typically thought of as stable are going to see some fairly strong cyclical growth. And the cyclical areas may actually be the ones that are challenged in in 2021. You know, Paul, you know, if we look at just healthcare from an industry standpoint, maybe you can discuss some of the impacts that you've seen with the healthcare system uh, attributed to COVID and what are some potential longer term impacts that, that may come out of this as well for healthcare? Yeah, I think, I think the most obvious uh, uh, 
thing was telehealth. I mean, we were all trying to develop telehealth and CMS would not reimburse it at the same level as a face-to-face -face visit. So there was no stimulus to actually get it going. And as soon as uh, the pandemic hit and people were afraid to come to their doctors, CMS started reimbursing for te telehealth at the same rate as a face-to-face -face visit. And guess what happened? It, telehealth boomed. And for, thank God, because about 30 or 40% of our total volume of visits ended up being televisits um, that were reimbursable. So the practice didn't lose as much money as we thought we would. That is going to stay, I think. Uh, and mm -hmm. there, there are per there. Are areas that are actually better suited for telehealth. Mental illness, for example, people, we our, our psychiatry department had a tripling of their visits through tele mental health uh, than they at their baseline. Now you could say, well, part of it's because everyone's miserable because of the pandemic and needed mental health. But the other thing is that people feel a lot more comfortable doing that from home than they do going to visit their um, their caregiver or their psychiatrist or psychologist. And so that is for sure. And then a lot of the preventive health and follow-up kind of uh, things for chronic disease management, I think are gonna be very, very uh, helpful and will continue to move forward. I think five to 10% of our volume will continue to be telehealth visits. And I think there's gonna be huge digital applications around wearables, devices, uh, that make it so that patients don't have to come to their medical center. Uh, we're doing a lot of, in rural communities now. I think, I think there'll be huge benefit to under-resourced communities that now can get telemedicine visits. So I think there's a lot of positives uh, mm -hmm. that, that come out of that. The, the other strange thing is, you know, I think what surprised everybody is how effective mask wearing was. Uh, there was. There was some data from the old flu uh, epidemics that, you know, putting a mask on helps uh, in families, but there was never really very strong data because uh, the way the studies were done is they, if you'd have to wear a mask while you're in the hospital or something, you go home and everybody took their mask off. Well, it turns out with this pandemic where everybody's pretty much forced to wear a mask in a lot of different environments, it was very effective. And so you wonder, you know, we're going to have the mildest flu season ever. Australia just had the mildest flu season they've ever had. And the reason was because everybody's wearing masks to prevent coronavirus. So I think that there's going to be some long-term uh, behavioral changes in facilities uh, like hospitals, where it may be fairly routine for people to be wearing masks while they're in the hospital, uh, even with visiting uh, patients and things like that. So I think there'll be some social behavioral things. And then the other thing that I think the two big, uh, big obvious things is, I mean, we really failed from a, a public health perspective. It was, and it's not, the, it's not the fault of our public health workers. But we, we just were not, we've been underfunding public health for a long period of time. Uh, and we sort of creaked along with what we had and then boom, we get hit by a major problem and we were unable to deal with it. And everything from contact tracing to just data management. So that whole infrastructure uh, has to be rebuilt. And so I think the public health uh, funding is going to be a high priority going forward. Not to mention the, the vaccine development. The reason we are slow to develop vaccines is in part because we're, we have this long regulatory cycle, but it's also because they're not profitable. The only reason everyone's racing to this is the government's prepaying this. You know, the mRNA vaccines are expensive, hard to make. Well, the government's prepaying it. So there has to be some sustainable vaccine programs for all these many, many infectious diseases, whether it's SARS, MERS, Zika, we, we should, you know, we shouldn't have to race for the next uh, pandemic. We should have a series of vaccines in process all the time. And that's gonna require government support because that's not something that commercial, uh, commercial companies will, will be able to sustain. Uh, remember the ideal thing, you look at, you know, how did Gilead go from nothing to being the largest, the third largest pharmaceutical? It's they have a, a, a long-term illness, HIV, that requires daily treatment forever. A vaccine, you give it once, you don't need to give it again. So there's no, the, the, the financial incentive for, for companies is really not there. So we have to, we have to change the financial model. I think it has to be more of a government-supported uh, long-term activity. So there's a, 
there may be others, but that that's enough, I think, to, to think about the changes in the future. Okay. Larry, as, as we look longer term uh, in real estate, you know, you hear a lot of people saying today, well, you know, uh, what COVID's done is now we've learned we can work remotely. Uh, we don't really need all this office space. So, you know, uh, the commercial real estate business is in deep trouble. And uh, because, uh, you know, like you said, with the airlines not traveling much and all that, but uh, I think you've got a little bit different perspective on that, and I and I think it's the right one. Tell us what you think uh, in that regard, but also just potential other longer term changes you expect for for the real estate market. Well, I think that, that's sort of the hot topic again in our business, um, and I think at the end of the day, Bill, you, you know, ultimately what drives a corporation, a company, a medical school is is culture and i think that the culture of an organization is primarily developed in person i just think that people being together uh, is what triggers innovation uh, it's what triggers collegiality uh, you really can't mentor people on a you know remotely on a consistent basis and so I think all of that, uh, this is a little bit like trying to call a football game in the middle of the third quarter. Uh, you know, we have a lot more still to play out before we learn what's going to happen. But I do think that there are some functions that can take place remotely. And I think we'll see some of that. And I think the, the other side of that is, as some companies may outsource or let, let folks work from home if they're performing certain functions, the other uh, element that's going to compete with that is we're not going to be as dense in our office space. So tenants will need more space. So you need more space to spread out more. But some of the people will be able to work remotely. But I even think that those remote functions will need to engage in the office uh, from time to time and come back to the office. So I'm, my anticipation and most of the people that I talk to, short term, sure, <clears throat> a lot more of the remote functions, especially during a surge. But this is very much in play. In other words, we're not through this yet. We're going to be, I think Dr. Klopman would say by the summer or, or something, we're going to be largely through this. Hopefully, if we can, if we can uh, mass uh, inoculate uh, the entire country. But my guess is over time, <clears throat> corporate cultures are going to require people to be together. So I, again, you would expect that kind of an answer from a commercial real estate person who's involved in office buildings and whatnot. But I think it's just pragmatic, and I don't think uh, I don't think we'll be able to, to function the way that most companies do when they're innovating and being creative uh, if everybody's remote. Uh, I think short term you're you're going to see a little bit of a push toward the suburbs, uh, but again, uh, longer term I think the urban settings are going to be uh, fine and in high demand. Uh, the, the the downtowns of America are not going to disappear with all of the uh, uh, urban amenities that people have become accustomed to. I do think the way people enjoy those amenities are going to change. I do think we'll have, you know, things like distancing and spacing and, and things will be part of our vernacular for a while. Uh, but the idea that, um, you know, all of that's going to completely turn on its head, I'm not a buyer of that. So I'm, I, I tend to be more opt optimistic about the return to the office. I think it'll take time. People have to be comfortable. We're, we're, we're largely coming back around the country. We were in 34 cities, as you know, Transwestern. And we're largely coming back, but less so in New York, less so in San Francisco. Uh, but, but again, we're doing it in a, in, a, in, a, in a thoughtful way, in a moderated way. We're, we're trying to roll out all of the protocols. We want everyone to come back and be here, but we want them to come back and be safe. And uh, I think that trend will continue, and that will become more obvious over time. Yeah, and to take your uh, football analogy, since we're in the third quarter, uh, as Baylor Bears, we all want to look forward to that last second field goal to win the game, right? So. <laughs> uh, Chris, uh, th there's been a lot of discussions uh, with COVID about global supply chains and uh, changes in global supply chains, uh, shifting uh, maybe uh, some of those supply chains to more nationalistic supply chains and all of that. What are you, what are you seeing in the markets and 
and uh, and uh, there's been a lot of talk, but are you seeing any evidence that uh, anything's moving that way? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And this is true not just with supply chains, but nearly any trend that was in the in the marketplace or any structural issue is going to have to be dealt with. COVID's just been an accelerant. It's just reduced the amount of time people had to address these challenges, whether it's a supply chain issue or a leverage issue or, or what it may be. Um, you know, we started moving supply chains back closer to home markets really in 2014. Um, and 2014 was when we saw a peak in, in global trade and global trade kind of leads liquidity for the rest of the world. So at that peak, and it actually coincided to Houston's benefit because as the US became energy independent, we weren't exporting dollars and therefore those dollars weren't there to support global trade. That is what made countries begin to turn inward and we started to see supply chains retreat at that point. And now what we've seen is not only the acceleration of that because that led to kind of this global populist behavior and then we've seen tariffs and protectionist measures across the globe, not just emanating from the US, but even emanating from other countries. Um, and then what COVID has done is, is really demonstrated the fragility of a global supply chain, especially one that was built around a just-in-time concept. Um, and so what we're gonna see is an acceleration of supply chains building up durability. So not just focused on just-in-time, but also focused on just-in-case. Um, and that's going to increase, you know, the cost of capital and the cost of doing business, doing business. And those that have scale will be able to thrive and take share in that environment. And those that won't will go by the wayside. Uh, but there's other factors as well. Um, you know, invariably behind the scenes, unaware, there's always a lot of innovation. And I don't think the market is truly aware of the impact of uh, additive manufacturing and, and 3D printing and what that's the impact that was going to have on supply chains as well. And so that's also going to be an accelerant. Um, so there's just no doubt that we're going to see a further retrenchment of global trade. There, there really isn't enough uh, private capital and, and sovereign balance sheet capacity to sustain the levels that existed pre-pandemic. Uh, but along with that, the trends were already in place for supply chains to localize and, and we're going to see that uh, just accelerate. It doesn't necessarily mean jobs come back. As, as, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of automation um, and Japan's been incredibly successful with the shrinking workforce, but yet growing GDP per capita via automation. And one of the biggest challenges every country faces, we, we less so, um, is most economic systems are built on a pyramid shape population where the next generation coming up is larger and that's broadly not the case. So with workforce shrinking globally, the US will be able to somewhat maintain its workforce. Uh, that's going to further pressure automation, which is also going to impact supply chains. So uh, no, no question that things are the trend that was in place is only accelerated at this stage. Okay, thanks. So uh, Dr. Klopman, you know, a lot of people always say, you know, what are some just what are some COVID guidelines you know when you deal with companies schools other entities and all of that I thought maybe you'd like to talk a little bit about some of the guidelines that Baylor College of Medicine has developed and uh, and how people might be able to access those guidelines because I think uh, uh, I think they're uh, uh, relevant and, and I think uh, very good well we we sort of filled in a gap, I think. Uh, the, the CDC came out with guidelines that were pretty extensive. And I think, I think a lot of the issues are very local, or, you know, uh, how do you manage your, your customer? How do you manage your workforce and where you get tested? Those are, those, those are things that are actually best done and thought about locally. So uh, we work together with the Greater Houston Partnership to basically create a guide for safely opening uh, businesses and actually uh, uh, Murray Bowden in Hanover is on our board. So he worked with Murray and, and, and sort of did it for real estate, commercial real estate. Uh, we worked with Mattress Mac <laughs> to develop safe practices uh, for retail. Uh, you know, and they're, they're all the things you would expect from directional flow, spacing. But how do you, you know, what do you do to tell your customer? What do you do to tell your employee? How do you, you know, 
remind them before, uh, during breaks and after work, you know, the kind of guidelines you need to follow and then where to get tested, when to get tested. All those are free and online. You can find them on, Greater, on the Greater Houston Partnership website or on the Baylor College of Medicine website. And we did the same thing working with the schools. People don't, many people don't realize that we manage uh, the curriculum for many, many schools. Uh, two middle schools in Houston, uh, one uh, high school, uh, the Bakey High School, and then eight in the Rio Grande Valley. And those are partnerships with the Southern Independent School District and the Harris County Independent School District. So they're, they're, they're both guidelines for teachers and superintendents to how to, how to make your, your place safe uh, it, it's, it, you know, the, it's kind of funny, uh, questions you get from a, a teacher in a room is like, I have a fan, should I turn the fan on? You know, th it's, it makes sense, right? But it depends if you have a window or not. <laughs> so those are, those, you know, ventilation was the most important thing and, you know, creating spaces indoors and outdoors that are safe. So that we posted also on, on uh, uh, BioEd Med Online. Again, it's available free. Uh, and we created a curriculum for teachers in four different uh, groupings, uh, K through third grade and third through sixth and middle school and high school. Uh, actual uh, lesson plans that you can download in, in, in around public health, around coronavirus. Uh, again, these were all in collaboration with this, the school district. So they're, they actually are able to earn credit for kids uh, going through school. And, and again, that's on Biomed Online. Uh, so all these are free and available. and. Uh, people should, you, know, you can either access it through our website or directly through the Greater Houston Partnership or even the school district. So we, we, we tried very hard to help uh, in all the local decision making, uh, uh, both for schools and businesses. Well, thank you, Paul. And uh, let me uh, kind of bring this session to an end. We're coming quickly to the top of the hour. Let me uh, uh, first of all, thank uh, Dr. Paul Klopman from Baylor College of Medicine and, and, uh, and frankly, Paul, for Baylor College of Medicine's leadership uh, during this, uh, uh, this past year and the ongoing leadership that we'll see as it relates to COVID, but also even beyond COVID. Uh, and then, Larry, thank you for your uh, participation from Transwestern and uh, Commercial Real Estate and Chris. Uh, it's been a great uh, panel discussion. And uh, your contributions, I know, uh, were enjoyed by all of those participating. I also want to just thank you uh, to everyone who joined us today. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's been a great uh, session and uh, something I think uh, hopefully each of us can use. Uh, so uh, again, thank you. Continue to look uh, every Tuesday. Uh, Baylor alumni should be get, getting an email from the Baylor uh, alumni group uh, with future uh, uh, sessions that are coming up. And so... Uh, make sure you tune in during this virtual time that uh, that we're in. So, again, thank you for joining. And uh, as always, I'll close this by saying, sick em bears. Mm -hmm.